One of the things that I wish I knew a lot about, but I don't, I haven't really put the time into it, is architecture. I really like art, and I really like design. I think well-designed things are very interesting. But I've never actually learned what it is about particular buildings that I like. I've never learned the different styles, the different eras, the really notable architects, that sort of thing. One thing I do know about architecture, and it's really more of a fun fact than it is anything about architecture, whispering galleries are pretty cool. I'm not sure if you've ever been to one. Some of the most famous ones in America are at Grand Central Terminal in New York City or the Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol. I don't think I've ever been to one. I I may have as a kid or something and not really be remembering it. But uh, if everything I'm about to say is wrong, if you're like an architect buff, please don't correct me. Let me keep believing what I believe about whispering galleries because I think they're awesome. If you and a friend were to stand at different points along the perimeter of these rooms, even if you just whispered, your voice will carry where you can hear it at any other point on the circumference, even though it's a giant room. In fact, a quick glance at the Wikipedia page for Whispering Gallery said this about St. Paul's Cathedral, where they allegedly were discovered. The sound is carried by waves, known as Whispering Gallery waves which seems awfully appropriate if you ask me, Uh, that travel around the circumference clinging to the walls, an effect that was discovered in the Whispering Gallery of St. Paul's Cathedral, London. The extent to which the sound travels at St. Paul's can also be judged by clapping in the gallery, which produces four echoes. Now, it might sound a little funny, but I think Whispering Galleries can actually teach us, help us understand something about the Bible. Because the Bible functions kind of like a whispering gallery does. What's spoken as a whisper in the Old Testament circulates and it reverberates and then it echoes in the New Testament. The very words of God as spoken through the law and the prophets and the writings, they cling to the walls of the cross so that we can hear them in full even on the other side of it, this far removed from the ancient world. In fact, it's only by following these echoes of the old in the new that we can make sense of how Jesus fits into the overarching story of God. This morning, I want to highlight Paul's use of Old Testament echoes in this passage from Philippians 2. I've adapted this concept from a book that came out in the 80s. It's called Echoes of Scripture in the Letters of Paul. It's a really excellent book, but it's also fairly academic, so I'll go ahead and spoil it so that none of you have to go buy a copy. Um, I know you were all like pulling out your phones to get on Amazon to buy a copy just because I brought, talked about an academic book on stage again. Um, however, uh, I won't make you do it. Often, Paul will allude to passages from the Old Testament without ever citing a source or introducing a quotation. So we can all think of those times when Paul says something like, Uh, do you not remember that it is written, or as it is written, or the saying that is written will take place, right? We've We've all seen Paul do that in his letters. But what I'm talking about this morning is the times that he doesn't tell us that he's quoting something. He doesn't tell us that he's alluding to the Old Testament, he just does it. And he usually does this by taking the language and setting of an Old Testament idea, and he sort of refits it into his context, making the text of Scripture like an echo of the Old Covenant in a New Covenant world. We've actually already seen one of these in Philippians. In chapter 1, 18 and 19, Paul is talking about his imprisonment. He says that through the Philippians' prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, sufferings will turn out for my deliverance. This phrase is word for word, identical to, to one that would be found in the Greek translation of Job, which the Philippians would have likely been reading. In Job 13, 16, we read Job say that, even this will turn out for my deliverance, for deceit shall not enter in before him. It's a subtle reference, right? It's just talking about uh, these things will turn out for my deliverance. And Paul gives no recognition to the source, but anyone who read it, who was familiar with the scriptures, would have read or heard that read, and they would have understood that he was trying to sort of color in the lines by evoking this image of Paul or of Job in his suffering, right? Paul is comparing his very own sufferings 
to those of Job. We could sum up what we've seen in Philippians thus far. Excuse me. Sorry, I jumped ahead. I jumped ahead of my manuscript. Uh, the reason I bring up this concept of echoes uh, is because Paul actually does it several times in our text today. Uh, listening closely for these can help us understand how the earliest Christians read the Bible. And it can help us hear exactly what Paul is trying to say. Right? So we've seen one of these echoes in Philippians 1. We're going to see a couple of them today in Philippians 2. In today's passage, he's drawing specifically on some scenes from Israel's story, scenes that would have uh, been part of sort of the collective or cultural memory of the Israelites, and it would have explained the urgency of Paul's words without him having to write an entire treatise. We could sum up what we've seen so far in Philippians in three main words, suffering, rejoicing, and unity. If you'll remember, Paul begins the letter with thanking the Philippians for their support throughout his ministry. In the midst of his suffering and his imprisonment, he shows that God has been working to advance the gospel, focusing especially on how the Philippian church had been working lockstep with him. He encourages the church to be obedient and unified, to rejoice in Christ and to keep the faith so that the gospel will continue to advance and he specifically draws his attention to the idea of his own presence, hoping they're not so fixated on whether or not he's with them, that they don't miss the forest for the trees, that instead they, as a collective group, the church at Philippi, can continue gospel ministry even if Paul is to depart from them. As we saw last week, Paul gives the ultimate example of this obedience, Christ Jesus himself who did not count equality with God a thing to be exploited, but instead emptied himself by taking on the likeness of humanity. And to summarize this week's text up front, um, we will be seeing how Paul instructs the church in Philippi not only to consider the attitude of Christ Jesus, like we saw last week, but to actually apply the attitude of Christ Jesus. In Philippians 2, Paul uses the picture of Christ's hum humility as the foundation for how he wants the Philippian church to relate to the broader themes of suffering, rejoicing, and unity that we have seen so far in the book. We should also note that today's text fits into the overall structure of the letter in a unique way. What we're looking at today is the final segment of a much larger section uh, where Paul kind of pivots with his subject matter and his tone and his words and that sort of thing. If you look back at Philippians 1.27, you might notice that Paul shifts from explaining his own story or describing his own circumstances, and he begins to issue a command directed at the Philippians. He changes from a posture of friendship to a posture of exhortation. If 1.12 to 26 is mostly about Paul's personal thoughts on the advance of the gospel, 1.27 to 2.18 mostly consists of Paul's instructions to the Philippian church. So it's almost like we can treat uh, everything since 126 like it was written in parentheses. That it's expounding on Paul's instructions on how to boast in Christ that he says in 126. He's trying to give a tangible picture of what it means for the Philippian church to obey in his absence. There are three main points that we will see in today's text, and I'm going to mostly let them be driven by this idea of Old Testament echoes. First, we'll see the command to work out our salvation with fear and trembling in verses 12 and 13. Then we're going to see that the church's role is to shine in the world by clinging to the word in verses 14 and the first half of 16. And then third, we will see that the final goal of the Christian life is to boast in Christ in the last day. And that will conclude our passage this morning, uh, the latter half of 16 to 18. Uh, so pretty clear divisions in the text that we're just going to kind of walk through and see how Paul is sort of building on these echoes of the Old Testament. Um, before we dive into the text, let's just pray together, uh, make sure we kind of cleanse our palates a little bit, clear our minds, focus on God, uh, and then we will jump right in. So pray with me, please. God... I thank you for sending your son. That I thank you that he did not count equality with the Father something to be exploited, but instead humbled himself by taking on our likeness. 
I thank you for so clearly passing down your word to us, tangibly and visibly in the person of Christ, yes, but also by the work of the Spirit, by handing down the Scriptures through the generations. These ancient texts that, that ring so clearly about your truth. I thank you that we have them. I thank you we can study them. I thank you that we know if we hold tight to them, we will end up in accordance with your will. I pray that our minds would be set on you this morning. I pray that uh, we would not grow weary in our listening. Uh, I pray that uh, you would help me uh, communicate the truths that you want communicated to First Baptist Alcoa, uh, the same truths that were communicated to the Church of Philippi uh, years and years and years ago. It is in your son's name I pray, amen. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, both to will and to work, according to his good purpose. Having reminded the church of his full confidence in their long-term obedience, and having reminded them of the way that Christ quite literally embodied obedience, Paul commands the church to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. And I think we need a firm grasp on what Paul is trying to communicate here. This is a, a verse that has given people trouble in the past. It's one that people get hung up on. And so I think we need to get a real firm foundation of what he's saying here before moving on. These verses kind of function like their uh, own chunk in the passage, if you'll notice, right? He kind of moves on to a, his next command after these two verses. So I think it's worth just breaking them down, looking at them kind of under a microscope, and then moving on to the rest of Philippians 2. First, we need to pay attention to the confusing relationship of the word work. I don't know if it struck you whenever you read the passage or if you've ever noticed it, but Paul commands the church to work out their salvation, but then he also says that God is the one who is working. Pretty confusing, right? What's happening there? There are plenty of places in the Bible we could point to to talk about that relationship between divine sovereignty and human responsibility, but I don't actually think that's Paul's interest here. The structure of his command actually clues us into the fact that Paul is probably not trying to say something about the mysterious inner mechanics of any given individual's salvation. Let's look at the actual grammar of the text. I know it's been a while since you've studied grammar in school, but let's look at it, okay? Most of your Bibles probably say this in verse 12, if I had to guess. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now work out your salvation. I think the rendering in the Christian Standard Bible is like just slightly clearer on this minor point. Uh, it reads, just as you have always obeyed, so now work out your salvation. This is a great example of why all those hours I spent half asleep in Dr. Ferguson's AP English class at Maryville were not actually a waste because I remember that certain kinds of clauses have to go together, right? We call them correlative conjunctions. You probably use them all the time without even thinking or realizing it. Either or, neither nor, both and. They really change the reading of the text once we realize that they have to work together, that they are necessarily dependent on each other. Paul is setting this passage up in the exact same way. We can't detach the so also of work out your own salvation from the just as you have always obeyed. We could restate Paul's main idea here a little more clearly by saying something like, in the same way that you obeyed before, continue living out your obedience. So this isn't a passage that's focused on how anyone is supposed to get saved. It's a passage about how saved people are supposed to live in light of their salvation. He's writing to a group of obedient Christians and reminding them that their present infighting and squabbling isn't actually in God's line or plan for his church to be formed into a people. After all, as Paul says, it is God who is working in us both to will and to work according to his good purpose. There is no tension within what Paul is trying to say here. Instead, he's understanding the command to work out their salvation, not in view of earning their salvation, but in view of continuing the salvation that they have already made evident in their past obedience. Second, 
we need to figure out why this phrase fear and trembling is here. The phrase fear and trembling is actually a really fascinating one. It has an Old Testament context. Uh, If you think about that concept of echoes, you could maybe argue this is the first one, although that's probably pushing it a little bit. Uh, But we do see this exact phrase in other places in the Bible. In Exodus and Isaiah, it's shown in reference to the wrath that God incurs against pagans. But then in Deuteronomy, it's used to talk about the sense of awe that God's people felt whenever they witnessed his mighty works. And then, one of the final Old Testament occurrences, the Psalms use it in reference to the human being's fear of death. So we don't really get a clear understanding of what does it mean, fear and trembling? What does this mean? However, we're fortunate because we can actually compare it to Paul's own writings. When reading the Bible, it's actually really helpful. This is true of any any text, really, uh, but especially ancient texts like the Bible. Whenever you're reading it and trying to figure out what does this word mean, look at how the author uses that word in other contexts, right? If the same author uses this word again, it might give us some ideas of what it meant to that person. Paul uses this phrase, fear and trembling, in both letters to the Corinthians and in his letter to the Ephesians. And the first and the most insightful occurrence is in 1 Corinthians 2. This is where Paul says that he comes to the Corinthians in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, deciding to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. It's a popular passage. I I hope you remember whenever we studied it, like at some point in the last two years, uh, we jumped around a lot, but uh, we did get to that passage at one point. And so fear and trembling is is a massive idea in Paul's thought, it seems seems to be the idea of gospel presence, right? 1 Corinthians 2, I came to you. But it's also a gospel presence that is ushered in by the human weakness of the cross, right? I came to you, and I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. For Paul, fear and trembling is representative of the fact that the work of the gospel is advanced by the most impotent expression of human vulnerability and weakness, the death of Christ on the cross, and the death of Christ as it affects our own death to self. With all this in mind, then, think about how we can piece together the bigger picture of what Paul's saying here. Paul says to continue in their obedience, not because they should be terrified of what happens or they won't be saved if they don't, He tells them to continue in their obedience because those who identify as those in Christ are those who pursue the weakness of the cross. To be in Christ is to put off the things that are mighty in this world, social influence, glory, wealth, power. The way of the cross is the way of sacrifice, of insufficiency, of repentance. This is what it means to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To confess the weakness of your own obedience to save yourself. In a very ironic turn of phrase, uh, the sentence, work out your salvation, is actually about the opposite of earning your salvation. It's about admitting that you never could. And then living your life in light of the fact that you can't. It's a command to know nothing among the world but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul continues his instruction in verse 14. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless and a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. If the last echo we heard was subtle, this one reverberates much, much louder. Here, Paul is intentionally drawing upon the imagery of Israel in the wilderness as an example for what he wants the Philippians to avoid becoming. If you'll remember the story, Moses leads God's people out of Egyptian captivity, and they go out into the wilderness. God brings them through the sea. He wipes out the Egyptians, right? We've all seen the cartoons and whatnot. And so, having just witnessed this great act of God, three days later, the Israelites begin to complain to Moses that they don't have any water. Which, we should just let that sink in for a second. Like, God has just literally split a sea that you have crossed through on dry ground, but then three days later, you're like, hey, I'm concerned we may not have enough water. 
It shows how uh, fickle us human beings are, right? And then not even two months after they have left Egypt, Exodus 16 tells us that the entire community grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying that they would have been better off if they would have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt whenever they had pots of meat and could eat all the bread they wanted. Instead, they followed them into the wilderness to make the whole assembly die of hunger, is what they complained. By echoing this image, Paul is comparing the Philippian disunity to that of Israel after their deliverance from slavery. And I know it may sound like I'm reading a little too much into it, but if you aren't convinced yet, consider the way that Paul is mirroring Moses' farewell discourse. Remember, Paul has constantly, throughout Philippians, been telling us that his presence doesn't really matter, right? That he hopes to return to them. He's not sure if he's going to be able to. He actually would really love to depart and be with the Lord, but he knows that it's better if he doesn't. So he's, he's trying to show that, hey, Paul doesn't really matter, that they can continue in Christian obedience without him, that they ought to pursue Christ-like unity through the cross, whether or not he is with them in body or not. He challenges them to, with or without him, become children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Listen to what Deuteronomy 32 says whenever Moses begins his farewell address. He knows that he will soon die, and so he begins to address the nation, talking about the faithfulness of God and the way that Israel's own wandering has led them astray. And he says this, The rock, his work is perfect, all his ways are just, A faithful God without bias, he is righteous and true. His people have acted corruptly toward him. This is their defect. They are not his children, but a devious and crooked generation. Sound familiar? Look back at Philippians. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so they may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation. And this, Paul is intentionally echoing both the Israelites complaining in the wilderness and the instruction of Moses' farewell discourse, because that would add an extra oomph to his argument. It helps color in the lines that he's drawing for the Philippian church. Explicitly, Paul is telling them they shouldn't complain, but implicitly, Paul is saying something like this, don't be like the grumbling nation of Israel. They fractured themselves into disobedience and disunity. And even though I may not always be with you, you need to avoid the same mistakes they made. In fact, he takes this echoing even one step further, suggesting that if they do avoid these things, this this disunity, if they do continue unified in their gospel work, that they will be the very light that lights up a dark and dying world. In the same way that Daniel 12 promises that those who follow God will be light in dark places, the Philippian church could be the people that has gospel insight and leads many to righteousness, shining like the bright expanse of the heavens and like the stars forever and ever, as it says in Daniel 12. One commentator suggests that Paul here is playing on a tension that we call the already and not yet, the tension between the kingdom of God that has already come and the aspects of it that have not yet been consummated as it will be on the last day. And by evoking this picture from Daniel 12, by introducing yet another echo, Paul more or less says that the Philippians, as they live out their calling as God's blameless children, already shine as stars as they hold firm to the word of life. Yet, the Philippians must persevere in this obedience, or Paul will have no boast at the end. So having heard several echoes at this point, let's backtrack a little and make sure we are on the same page here. Paul has commanded the people that they need to continue in their obedience, that they can live the cross-centered life if they keep dying to self, if they approach one another through the weakness of the cross. And then he's alluded throughout the letter that his presence is never a guarantee, and he wants them to maintain his obedience without him there. So he puts himself in the shoes of Moses, right? Right? charging them to be the truer and better Israel, to be God's people, but without complaining and without fracturing the community. And then, finally, by invoking Daniel's vision of the end of all things, Paul challenges them, persevere to the end for the sake of bringing salvation to the whole world. This brings us to an important sub-point or application point of the text, 
The best witness to a sinful and dying world is a church that clings to the word of life. In writing to the Philippians, Paul could have chosen to say whatever he wanted. This guy had been on missionary journeys. This guy has been in prison. This guy has seen churches in all kinds of different contexts. But he doesn't give them a five-step guide to becoming a perfect, healthy church. Paul doesn't outline a church growth plan. He doesn't tell them that they need to jump in on the greatest, newest, latest fads. Instead, he tells them that the best way to witness to the world is to hold firmly to the word of life, to continue in their gospel obedience, to not change course. The Old Testament echoes have promised us, if you continue obeying God, you will endure to the end. And what's his motive for wanting them to endure? It's not only the salvation of others, it is also his very boasting. Now, I want to pause really quick, and I want to ask you, when's the last time you boasted about something? We're typically taught not to do it from a pretty young age. Some of you may be like me. I kind of have the opposite problem because I'm like too down on myself. I have like low self-esteem and whatnot. And so it's like, I'm probably not giving myself credit where I should. Uh, you may, maybe you relate to that, uh, which feels like its own kind of boasting, right? It's like two sides of the same coin. But I was trying to think about a good illustration for boasting. I couldn't think of what would work. And then yesterday I had this eureka moment. Do you want to know someone who loves to boast? I mean, this person will boast about literally anything. I'm talking, obviously, about my four-year-old niece, Nora. Just yesterday, we were looking at t-ball practice photos, and she was bragging about how she beat all the other kids when she was running to first base. Now, mind you, there were only supposed to be one kids running to first base, but somehow she made it a competition. I remember earlier this year getting to watch the Super Bowl at my brother's house. My brother's an Eagles fan, and I'm a Chiefs fan, so it was a very tense game for us, and my mom decided that I guess we should both be in the same room at the same time during that. Um, and so here I am in the first quarter, second quarter, super stressed out, like wanting to leave uh, because I'm just having a terrible time. Feels like the Chiefs are throwing the game away. She looks over at me. She's sitting at, at, at another couch. She looks over at me, runs to me, looks me very closely in my eyes and says, and I quote, we have 14, you have seven. I don't know if my brother ever had the heart to tell her how the game ended up after she went to bed. Uh, so like a good uncle, I've never brought it up again. <laughs> but Paul's excitement about boasting in this passage strikes us as pretty weird, right? Like it just, what's, what's he getting at there? After we just spent so much energy, I mean, he dedicated this whole chapter to this concept of humility and obedience and unity and putting others first. So it's odd to hear Paul talk about boasting. Look back at the text. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. It really kind of feels like Paul's setting up his own boasting to be the payoff of the whole passage, doesn't it? He tells them to be obedient so that he can boast. Boasting is actually an, an important concept in Paul's thought. It occurs 50 times in the New Testament, and all but four of those are in Paul's writings. Not only does he talk about it in other places in the New Testament, he also has already talked about it in Philippians. Remember how we talked about this whole section kind of being like one giant set of parentheses? If you return back to 125 and 26, Paul says that he knows the Philippians will remain and continue in the faith so that because of his coming to them, their boasting in Christ may abound. Boasting is the final echo I think we see in this text in Philippians. This time it, it's pulled most likely from Jeremiah 9 where Jeremiah writes this. This is what the Lord says. The wise person should not boast in his wisdom. The strong should not boast in his strength. The wealthy should not boast in his wealth, but the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, showing faithful love, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things. Reiterating the way of the cross by referencing this passage from Jeremiah, Paul suggests that boasting is not found in wisdom, strength, or wealth. 
And in fact, Romans 5, he says that it can't even be found in the law. Instead, boasting is found in the knowledge and understanding of God himself and the display of his love, justice, and righteousness on the earth. Displaying and imaging the gospel message as Christ himself has embodied it. As we will see when we get to Philippians 3, Paul says that the grounds for boasting comes from the work of the triune God, not from the works of the flesh. And indeed, if anyone had a reason to boast, it's Paul because he was the Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul's comment about his boasting then should not be read along the lines of, hey, Philippians, do a really good job so that my church planting resume looks really good to God when I get to the throne. Instead, it has more to do with the common bond of mutual boasting in Christ. That bond found between Philippians and Paul, both embracing the way of the cross. Weakness, dying to self, done with fear and trembling, so that they, as a unified front, can send the gospel out into a dark world. All in all, Paul is seeking to underscore what he has been saying all along. That as the church, we are better relying on one another to fulfill our gospel vocations rather than relying on ourselves. Our union with Christ cultivates unity with one another and strengthens our work through the Spirit and in accordance with the plans of God. Each one of us can identify with the nation of Israel, I think, both on an individual and on a corporate level. Sure, we have all each individually gone astray, right? We've all complained about the path that God is, seems to be taking our life down, failing to consider that he is actually working it out for our good. When I come to the end of this passage, and as I try to figure out where the rubber really meets the road, so to speak, I'm left with this. As First Baptist Alcoa, where do we want to find our boasting? In the law or in the God of the gospel? Corporately, we are at a critical season of life as a church. We shouldn't kid ourselves about it, right? We're left with a decision to make in the coming months, coming years, whatever this timeline of uncertainty looks like. But we have a decision, and it's an important one. There's two paths before us. We can be like Israel. We can grumble and complain and forget where God has brought us. We can neglect the image of his hand in our lives. We can neglect to take the way of the cross. Or we can take Paul's words seriously. We can persist in Christ and hold firmly to the word of life passed down through the scriptures. I'll say this much, and I'm speaking less as the one preaching and more as part of this family. I've watched this church face difficulty after difficulty over the years. The last few decades have been uncomfortable, and many of you have told me that. You've said it to me. But like Paul tells the Philippians, I want to remind you of this. I've consistently watched you come out the other side of it, wanting to love God and follow his plans. I know firsthand that you have made your faithfulness known in previous years. So let me encourage you, even in the midst of a trying and a difficult season, Continue in your obedience to God even when church feels hard. Your former obedience shows me that as a church, you are capable of full confidence for us to enter together into a new season of gospel ministry. So many of you, I have had so many conversations with you talking about how you have a heart for the community around us, how you want to give sacrificially, and how you have given sacrificially over the years. So many of you want to see lost people come to a saving knowledge of Christ as their Savior. Like Moses told the Israelites and like Paul told the Philippians, corporate obedience to God is far more important than any one person could be. The local church is not a cult of personality, but a body of believers in the God of the universe who works all things according to his plan. And together, in unity, we can all each work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We can help one another embrace the way of the cross, holding firmly to the word of life so that we can take the good news of the gospel out to a dying world. We ought not grumble or complain like the nation of Israel, but instead know that our boasting lies in one another, 
that the glory of running the race is not found in the number of people on membership rolls or the amount of money we're bringing in weekly. Rather, it's the number of people we see working out their salvation with fear and trembling and people becoming servants of Christ. Reflect on that for yourself. Take it with you this week. Which do you want to choose, the path of Israel in the wilderness or the path clinging to the word of life? And if we choose to cling to the word of life, working out our salvation, I think we will find that our church will indeed shine like lights in the world. I'm going to ask Raymond to go ahead and come up so he can pray for us uh, so I can get ready to close in song. Um, But if you need to talk about the gospel or if you need prayer, we have a response room out these doors slightly to the right. One of our elders and his wife will be there to talk with you and pray with you. Um, You can also find any of us after the service. We would be thrilled to talk to you about the word of life that we hope to see you cling to.